Wow, I wouldn't want to follow that guy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so thank you everyone for coming out. Um, my name is Adam Blandon. I'm the Chief Science Officer at Antoxerine um, and Icor Therapeutics and really all of Icor's portfolio companies. And what I wanted to talk with you about today briefly is our small molecule drug discovery effort uh, going after the P53 FOXO4 pathway. But before we get into that, I'd like to thank the team. Um, we're working at Intoxerine, we have the best team, and I know everyone says that, but my team really is the best. Um, they work far longer and far harder than anyone has any right to expect, so thank you guys for making this happen. Uh, and I would also like to thank um, those who have continuously funded our research. Thank you to Sense Foundation and Kazoo especially for um, their continued support of what we do. Without you, this wouldn't be possible either. Um, I have to say, though, at a, at a conference such as this, I'm giving a presentation about senescence, but I feel a little bit out of place because I'm not really a senescence biologist or an anti-aging biologist. Uh, I'm a biophysicist. Um, I spend my time expressing proteins and doing energetic plots and, and things like that. Um, but I've had to do a considerable amount of reading, obviously, when, when we decided that we were going to take on this project. And what became very exciting for me, because my, my biological discipline, I suppose, would be in tumor suppressors for cancer. Um, I began learning that, or at least when, when I read these papers, I see a lot of what cancer went through in the 1990s when we started realizing cancer isn't one thing, it's very many things, some of those things are good, some of those things are bad, and you don't just want to get rid of all of these pathways. Senescence is very much going through the same kind of thing as we're just trying to slog through and figure out what these different pathways are. And uh, when we talked with uh, Judith Campisi about this project, the way she would put it is, uh, thank goodness that's true. Because we have the opportunity then um, to avoid interfering senescence where it's helpful, uh, like in embryological development and in preventing cancer and in wound healing, um, but may be able to interfere with senescence um, in age-related pathology. Uh, so there's been a particular tumor suppressor that's occupied the majority of my professional time over the last seven years, and that, of course, is the guardian of the genome, uh, P53, also in, very important in senescence. And to a biophysicist, what's interesting about P53, in addition to that it sits kind of at the node of uh, a myriad of damage-sensing pathways and prevents cells from progressing through the cell cycle when they shouldn't, um, it's really a kind of interesting and complex protein. Um, it's got uh, three primary structure domains shown here in cartoons, like the uh, tetramerization domain, the DNA binding domain, and, and this small domain up here, the transactivation domain. But a lot of the protein is these unstructured, intrinsically disordered regions. Um, and that's problematic for biophysicists. We don't really like things that move around like that. It makes the proteins very difficult to work with. And I remember very distinctly sitting with um, Arnold Levine, the guy who discovered the protein at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and he was lamenting that all of the biophysics that's done with P53 is either done with small protein fragments like these domains, or it's done with hyperstable mutants. And he was concerned as a biologist, how could he really trust the things that we were producing if we weren't working with the bona fide intact protein? And I, I think that concern might be a little bit extreme. We've been working with protein fragments and mutants for a very long time. We've developed drugs with them. But one can see his point. Uh, when you're talking about these, these intrinsically disordered proteins, what the cell sees are these really large, extensive binding interfaces, like this is the weight of a P53 tetramer, this of a FOXO4 that we will get to. And, and there's these, these just large, kind of poorly defined interaction interfaces. And when we work with Fragments, we buy ourselves a few things. We buy ourselves ease of use, we buy ourselves stability and structural definition, but one can readily appreciate that you're really only sampling a very small portion of the conformational space that's available to you. So back during my graduate work, I made it a goal to try and develop a technology that would allow me to express this protein in the scales that we would need to do traditional biophysics without mutating it, without fragmenting it, without doing any of those things, and to cut a long story very, very short, uh, we succeeded in doing that. Um, the current generation of that technology is called the RPTAG technology. Um, I'm not really going to go into details for it. If you, if you want more information, we have a booth in the back. But suffice it to say, it is a very stable, very soluble, very highly expressing protein tagging system that allowed us to express P53 and a number of other very unstable proteins in, in, in really large amounts. For, for the effort I'm about to show you, we went through um, more than a gram of P53. 
um, which is more than I used in my entire graduate work over five years of any protein. Uh, this is just some data validating the P53 that we made, so you can see that it's migrating where you would expect, P53, so 53. It's reasonably pure. Um, and when we look at what it looks like, this is a gel filtration chromatogram, um, and it's migrating mostly as a monodispersed peak where we would expect the tetramer to be, and that's very important because when proteins dimerize and tetramerize, um, they make new binding interfaces that the monomers don't have. Um, and a little bit of protein that's aggregated, but really nothing to write home about. And the protein's also active, so if we look at this, this is just a gel-based um, DNA binding assay, and we can see that the tetramer um, binds and shifts the fluorescent band quite nicely. And as I mentioned before, the majority of the work that's been going on in P53 has been for its role in cancer. It is the most commonly mutated protein in human cancer, but it's been a rather persnickety target. Um, there are no drugs that target it in cancer in the clinic, and people have really made a shift away from trying to go after the protein proper, and they go after negative regulators. In cancer, the one is MDM2, um, but Roche is, kind of, Roche is kind of all over that. There's a lot of work that's been done in that space already. And then we were thrilled when, when this paper came out in er, early last year, Peter DeKaiser's group defining the P53 FOXO4 interaction as an important interaction in at least some kinds of senescence. And uh, this was exciting to us because we thought, hey, here's an, here's an opportunity for us to apply our technology, and we have the ability to do the same kinds of things that Roche did for cancer, but now we can do it on full-length proteins, and now we can learn from all the things that, now we can learn from all the things that they did to make that happen. So maybe we're a little bit farther along simply because we're, we're a little bit older than we used to be. Um, so then we, of course, had to make the full-length FOXO4. I was shocked at how difficult this protein was. It's actually much more difficult than P53 to make. We did use our, tech, we did use our, our tag to do it, but that, that wasn't nearly good enough. Um, at least in part, it's like an eight-step like eight prep. You have, we had to do a lot of clonal screening, but we do have a good producing clone. Um, this is showing that it's nice and monodispersed at about the appropriate molecular weight for that kind of a thing. We have mass spec confirmation it is what it is. And if we look over here at what we're looking at here is a DNA binding curve, because Voxophore is a transcription factor, and it is, it is bioactive as well. So pure, proper confirmation binding its, uh, binding its uh, DNA binding target. Um, and what was remarkable, I didn't expect the effects to be this great. When we started working with the full-length proteins, again, the, these proteins were also very difficult to label. For some reason, FOXO4, you try and put a fluorophore on it, it crashes right out. We had to go through hundreds of conditions to find some that worked. Um, but we did that, and we did some comparative binding analysis. So when you take P53 fragments, like the DNA binding domain and the FOXO4 fragments that most people use simply because it's very easy to make, um, you find that they do bind one another, and they have, but they have a very weak KD on the order of six micromolars. That's, that's kind of weak. But when we shift to either full-length P53 or both full-length P53 and FOXO4, you see that the binding interaction gets markedly tighter. Now, KD isn't everything as it comes to binding interactions, but the point is what we're seeing is a remarkable difference in how these proteins bind each other when they are what biology uses, the full-length proteins, rather than what we would prefer to use in vitro, which is the fragments. But this does come at a slight cost. When you work with the small protein fragments, you have structural information that you can use. The crystal structures of both of the tiny fragments are known, and if you find something that disrupts the interaction, you know almost exactly where it's binding, because the, because the fragments are small. When you work with these large intrinsically disordered proteins that can't be concentrated to the point you would need to do typical X-ray crystallography or, or NMR or things like that, um, you deny yourself the structural information, but you get to cast a much wider net. So I, I would liken it to fishing with a fishing pole versus fishing with a commercial net. Um, and in light of that, instead of trying to go down the route of, well, let's try and do some predictive structural algorithm or try and get fancy with, with, with computers, mostly because I don't understand computers anyway, um, what we decided to do was buy as many molecules as we really could, um, as we really could commit to the project and do just classic brute force high throughput screening. And it's not a huge library, but it's respectable. Uh, but we also said, well, let's be a little bit clever, and let's not do one high throughput screen, let's do two. Because we don't want molecules that are either non-specifically interfering with the assays, because that represents anywhere from 5 to 10 percent of your commercial libraries anyway, these so-called pain molecules. And we don't want molecules that are just interfering with P53 and interacting its oncology pathway. We want things that are just going after P53 and FOXO4. So we ran those two high-throughput screens on those two targets in parallel, and anything that hit on both we rejected, 
and we only brought forth the ones that specifically hit the Foxo 4. And I won't bore you with the screens and the rescreens and all sorts of the other things. I'll just kind of cut to the chase um, and show you um, the assays that we submitted. These two are really quite good. Um, the important number here is the Z factor. It's a way that you can categorize your high throughput, how good your assay is for high throughput screening. Um, it, the number varies from one for a perfect assay down to negative infinity. Anything above 0.4 or 0.5 is good. Um, so at 0.63, we're much, much more than 12 standard deviations between positive and negative controls. Um, DRI peptide works wonderfully in this assay. Um, and the same thing for MDM2. So these are really very high, these are high quality assays. And uh, the best hit from this screen, I apologize, my IP attorneys would not let me share the structure with you. They'd get very grumpy with me. But nonetheless, um, we've coded it ANX001 because we're very inventive with our naming conventions. And um, you can see that we get a nice uh, concentration dependent uh, decrease in the FOXO4 binding, in the P53 FOXO4 binding as we increase that concentration. And we've just now started moving into biology. We brought on a full time biologist who can work on, um, who's going to do all sorts of transcriptional profiling and things like that. But I wanted to share this with you at least today. Uh, we did do beta, beta galactosidase staining and uh, found that. Um, in the DNA damaged senescent IMR 90s, um, you see we get an increase in uh, the staining as you would expect when we damage them. And then as we treat with our compound, we get a marked decrease in that um, beta galactosidase phenotype. So just to wrap up, um, I hope I've convinced you that biology uses full size proteins, and at least in some applications, so should we. Uh, so we did that with P53 and FOXO4, and we developed a high throughput screening compatible assay, did that high throughput screen, and now we have lead compounds that we will be following up on as we develop these towards a, a small molecule disruptor of the interaction and hopefully senolytic in the future. Thank you.